Well, this has already been a very uh, deeply moving experience for me personally. Um, it seems to be a spiritual rule that when you make a certain motion in an effort to offer the humble and in my case miserable um, crumbs that I've managed to gather from the table of uh, truly great giants in the orthodox tradition. When you make a, even the tiniest effort to, uh, to do that, and how could I not with uh, such wonderful people as, uh, as Innocent, who has helped to organize this entire event with the blessing and the support of Father Tom, such a wonderful pastor with love and experience. Yes, then, then somehow God rewards you in ways that are simply unfathomable. And then one is faced with the almost impossible task of finding ways to thank God and um, show our gratitude um, in return for what he gives us. As one person, uh, a priest, said to me once upon a time, not too long ago, it seems that when you ask God, the Lord for a loaf of bread, he gives you 5,000. And after speaking with uh, a number of you already, I'm totally convinced at this point that you really don't need to hear me say uh, much of anything at all. Um, such is, the, uh, is my own level, and uh, the depth of my understanding is, is, uh, is a contradiction in terms. Um, perhaps, you, perhaps you would benefit from someone like uh, Archimandrite Zacharias, or uh, Ke Klaus Kenneth, who have uh, lived profound states, uh, who have come through truly um, difficult times and have uh, learned the ways, the ways of the Lord and can truly witness to absolute and perfect forgiveness in Christ. The love of Christ, the regenerating love of Jesus Christ. Not from, not from book learning, as you say, but from a life lived with all the difficulties that face us in today's world, with all the human passions that we've always had, of course, and we, all, we, we have to contend with, that, that love that transforms us and raises us and raises us miraculously to the level of divine being, to the level of divine existence, the plane of the life of the Most Holy Trinity. Uh, because that is what distinguishes the Orthodox faith, I believe, from uh, any other, that God, in His infinite mercy, is able to take us from wherever uh, He may find us, and to raise us to the right hand of God the Father in Christ Jesus. It's the content of uh, salvation, it's the meaning of salvation uh, in the Orthodox tradition that is so uh, unique and inspiring. It's a message that I believe is uh, 
majestic because it reveals to us God's purpose in his creation of man. And so today I want to um, read to you uh, a chapter from my recently released book entitled The Orthodox Understanding of Salvation. And I hope that uh, once I have done so, that you may um, have some questions. And uh, even more, I hope that I may have some answers for those questions. Um, but um, so I, I beg for your uh, charity and um, leniency <clears throat> as I share this, uh, this chapter on the orthodox understanding of salvation, specifically um, drawing from the tradition of my own spiritual father, Elder Sophroni, and of his spiritual father, Saint Siloan the Athenite, who together represents a certain uh, lineage in um, orthodox tradition, which is, uh, of course, abundantly evident when you see take a look at the kind of books that we uh, publish in Mount Tabor. I believe uh, that good books are always helpful and a great blessing, especially books that are not just uh, conveyors of uh, fascinating uh, bits of information, but which are able to transform <coughs> lives. So, the Orthodox understanding of salvation, Theosis in St. Siloan the Athenite and Elder Sophroni of Essex. Coming into contact with Father Sophroni was always an event of a most especial kind. His monastics first and foremost, but also those who made up his wider spiritual family lived, as Father Zacharias puts it, in an abundance of the Word of God. As a young boy, I had the blessing of serving each Sunday in the altar of the monastery of St. John the Baptist, Essex, England. One day, when I was still a lad of only 15 or 16 years of age, following the Divine Liturgy, and whilst standing in the prothesis of All Saints Church, Father Sophroni asked me why I was looking so thoughtful. Embarrassed that I was preoccupied with such mundane matters, I had to confess that school examinations were on the horizon and that I wanted to do well in them. To my surprise, however, Father Sophroni did not belittle my worldly anxiety, but gently nodded his head and agreed that it was indeed important to do well in examinations, and that to do so required much toil and sacrifice. But then he also added, as to a friend, that in this world there is nothing more difficult than to be saved. The force of the truth of these words struck deep in my heart. We often encounter in ourselves and in others the attitude which suggests that salvation is something that we can leave until later, once, that is, we have taken care of more pressing matters. Father Sophroni's perspective was quite different, however. By pointing to the incomparable difficulty of attaining to salvation, he was clearly placing it at the very top of our list of urgent priorities. And when one pauses to consider all the great achievements of mankind, past and present, whether they be of a scientific or literary character, in the world of politics or finance or physical endeavor, Father Sophroni's words seem bold and even provocative. 
a hard saying, but nevertheless fundamentally quite true. Upon later reflection, I realized that the reason why Father Sophroni's words rang so true that day is because of the wealth of meaning which salvation has for us in the Orthodox Church. By others, salvation is often understood simply in terms of deliverance from sin and its consequences and admission to heaven, in terms of escaping damnation and reaching a safe place where we can no longer be tormented by the enemy. According to the fathers of the church, however, salvation is not so prosaic a matter, for it involves the theosis, the deification or divinization of the entire human person in Christ. It involves, that is, becoming like unto Christ to the point of identity with him. It involves acquiring the mind of Christ, as St. Paul affirms in the second chapter of the first epistle to the Corinthians. And indeed, it signifies the sharing in his very life. In our brief and humble examination of the content and meaning of theosis or deification in St. Siloan and Staric Sophroni, I should like to focus on three main areas. Firstly, Christ as the measure of our deification. Secondly, love for enemies as the measure of our likeness to Christ. And thirdly, holy relics as a witness to the love of Christ in us. First then, Christ as the measure of our deification. Christ is the measure of all things, both divine and human. Since the divine ascension, our human nature has been raised up to the right hand of God the Father, as Father Sophroni puts it, as Father Sophroni points out, in his divine person, the Son and Word of God was, of course, always seated on the right hand of the Father, being consubstantial with him. The divine purpose for the human race, however, is seen in the union of our human nature to the divine person of Christ the second person of the Holy Trinity, in its being raised to the right hand of the Father. St. Paul, the great apostle of the Word of God made flesh, identifies the divine purpose of the Incarnation with our adoption as sons of God. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. In Christ Jesus, therefore, we encounter both true and perfect God and true and perfect man. In other words, we see in him not only the great God and Saviour, but also what or who we have been called to become sons and heirs of God the Father. Saint Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyon, in refuting the heresy of the Gnostics of the second century, described the divine purpose succinctly in this way. If the Word is made man, it is that men might become gods. 
and the champion of Nicene Orthodoxy, Athanasius the Great, writing in the fourth century, reaffirms the biblical and Irenaean position. God became man, he says, that we might be made gods. God became man that we might be made gods. What a daring statement. But what exactly does it mean for us to become gods? Can we created mortals become uncreated and immortal? Is this not an impossibility, an impiety, or even a blasphemy? In what then does our becoming gods, our deification or divinization, our theosis, consist? As Archimandrite Sophroni explains in his spiritual autobiography, we shall see him as he is, Christ manifested the perfection of the divine image in man and the possibility for our nature of assimilating the fullness of divinization to the very extent that after his ascension, he placed our nature on the right hand of the Father. Note here that the expression on the right hand of the Father denotes nothing less than equality with the Father. Thus, since the time of the divine ascension of Christ, our human nature has been deified in him and raised up to the right hand of God the Father. Significantly, however, Archimandrite Sophroni also adds the following, but even in him, our nature did not become one with the essence of the uncreated God. In Christ, incarnate Son of the Father, we contemplate God's pre-eternal idea of man. So, in Christ Jesus, we find man's rightful place on the right hand of the Father, sharing in the divine life. But, as with the two natures in Christ, man has been called to be united with God without mixture or confusion of any kind. That is to say, we never cease to be his creatures, since he alone is uncreated. This fundamental distinction is of inestimable significance in patristic theology. Nevertheless, in the union of our human nature to the second person of the Holy Trinity, we also see what, in theological terminology, is called the communicatio idiomatum. That is, the exchange of natural properties belonging to each of Christ's two natures. This may also be described in terms of the interpenetration of the natural energy of each of the two natures in Christ, in each other. As a simple illustration of this, we have the gospel narrative of the Transfiguration in Luke 9.28, where we first see Christ praying, performing, that is, an act which is proper to his human, but not to his divine nature. While moments later, we find his humanity sharing in, indeed resplendent with, his divine glory, which is proper only to the divine nature. St. Cyril of Alexandria describes the scene in this way. The blessed disciples slept for a short while as Christ gave himself to prayer, for he voluntarily fulfilled his human obligations. Later, on waking, they became beholders of his most holy and wondrous change. Staritz Sophroni points out 
that the union of the human nature in Christ is, of course, hypostatic or prosopic. That is to say that Christ is a divine person, the person of the Son and Word of God. But it is equally important to note that the union of the two natures in Christ is also energetic. The significance of this energetic interpenetration of the divine and human natures in each other is of paramount importance for us human beings in that it forms the basis of our own union with God, which is also energetic and not essential or hypostatic. In other words, it proves to us that the example of Christ is also realizable, also attainable, by us human persons, and that theosis, to the point of divine perfection, far from being optional, is in fact an obligation. In this sense, that Staret Sophroni understands the exhortation, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Father Sophroni also highlights another mystery concerning the life of Christ on earth as a model and pattern for our own life in Christ. This is revealed in the fact that even with the human nature of Christ, we may observe a certain growth or dynamism, or, as Holy Scripture puts it, a certain increase. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Thus, before all things had been fulfilled, even after the hypostatic union of human nature to the divine person of the Word, even after his assumption of our humanity into his divine person, even Christ, in his human aspect, appears as increasing in perfection. Hence, he also undergoes temptations and even reached the point of agony. This, as Father Sophroni remarks, is due principally to a certain division which may be observed in Christ before his glorious ascension, owing to the asymmetry of his natures. Following his ascension and the sitting of Christ, the Son of Man, on the right hand of God the Father, we have the new vision of the Christ man as equal to God. Not, of course, according to his nature, but according to his energy. Father Sophroni cautiously notes, however, that this does not refer to Christ's hypostatic aspect, for the pre-eternal and uncreated word remains such even after his incarnation. Nevertheless, in the human aspect of his union and existence, we find once again the model and pattern for our own life in Christ. For as Staret Sophroni puts it, Christ is the unshakable foundation and the ultimate criterion for the anthropological teaching of the Church. Whatever we confess concerning the humanity of Christ is also an indication of the eternal divine plan for man in general. The fact that in the Christ man his hypostasis is God in no way diminishes the possibility for us humans to follow his example, after which in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren. If it is true that Christ is the Son of Man, consubstantial with us, then it follows that everything that he accomplished in his earthly life must likewise be possible for the rest of the sons of men. 
And for this reason, Father Sofroni adds that if we confess his full and perfect theosis, it behoves us also to hope for the same degree of theosis for the saints in the age to come. The fundamental theological concern behind all that we have said so far is soteriological. That is to say, it concerns our salvation in a most fundamental way. Why? Because of the simple fact that we cannot live with Christ if we are not like him in all respects. As the great Hierophant, John the theologian and evangelist, proclaims, we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So, if we wish to be eternally with Christ, we must become like him. And this process of becoming Christ-like, this purification, invariably involves repentance, a fundamental change in our whole way of life, in our very mode of being. St. Simeon, the new theologian, in his hymn number 44, reiterates this point in the following way. The Master is in no way envious of mortal men that they should appear equal to him by divine grace. Neither does he deem his servants unworthy to be like unto him, but rather does he delight and rejoice to see us who were made men such as to become by grace what he is by nature. And he is so beneficent that he wills us to become even as he is. For if we be not as he is, exactly like unto him in every way, how could we be united to him? How could we dwell in him, as he said, without being like unto him? And how could he dwell in us if we be not as he is? Again, concerning the awesomeness of our inheritance, the great Paul in Romans writes the following. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Father Sofroni also makes another very interesting and important observation concerning the example given by Christ and our own theosis or deification. He points to the fact that even though the deification of Christ's human nature was, as St. John Damascene says, effected from the very moment in which he assumed our nature, nevertheless, Christ as man shied away from anything which might give the impression of autotheosis, that is to say, self-deification or self-divinization. That is why we see the action of the Holy Spirit underlined at his holy birth. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Also, the Holy Spirit descends upon Christ at his baptism in the Jordan, 
And concerning the resurrection, the scriptures speak thus, God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory. And finally, Christ himself teaching us the way of humility and how always to ascribe glory to our Heavenly Father says, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. The same movement may be observed in the divine liturgy. The words of institution, take, eat, this is my body, drink of this all of you, this is my blood, by themselves are not regarded as sufficient to effect the consecration of the holy gifts. They must be accompanied by the epiclesis, the invocation of the Holy Spirit, precisely in order to avoid any notion of self-deification, to avoid, that is, giving the impression that simply by speaking the words which God Christ spoke, we are able to transform the holy gifts into the precious body and blood of Christ. Of course, at the heart of this movement lies the truth that the action of Father, Son and Holy Spirit is always one and the same. The three divine hypostases always act together always act in unison, which is an expression of their consubstantiality. It behoves us to beseech God the Father to send down the Holy Spirit, by whose power the change of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ is effected. Secondly, love for enemies as the measure of our likeness to Christ. Now, although St. Siloan himself, as far as I'm aware, does not actually use the term theosis, the deification of the human person in Christ is certainly a golden thread which may be traced throughout his writings. For St. Siloan, the fundamental criterion by which a person may measure his or her likeness to Christ is love for one's enemies. As he says, Christ prayed for them that were crucifying him. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Stephen the martyr prayed for those who stoned him, that the Lord lay not this sin to their charge. And we, if we wish to preserve grace, must pray for our enemies. Herein lies the mystery of the divine mode of being, God's very way of life, humility. Humility on the ascetic plane, explains Father Sophroni, is manifested as regarding oneself as the worst of all sinners, while on the theological plane, Humility is revealed as love, which is given freely and completely. Saint Siloan, who was himself possessed of this divine love, humbly warns us to be watchful. If you do not feel pity for the sinner destined to suffer the pains of hell fire, it means that the grace of the Holy Spirit is not in you but an evil spirit. While you are still alive, therefore, strive by repentance to free yourself from this spirit. The struggle for Christ-like love for one's enemies and humility and against pride is a very great one indeed. And that is why the saints, the true imitators of Christ and sharers in his love, are great indeed. St. Siloan writes, 
I am a sorry wretch, as the Lord knows, but my pleasure is to humble my soul and love my neighbor, though he may have given me offense. At all times I beseech the Lord, who is merciful, to grant that I may love my enemies. And by the grace of God, I have experienced what the love of God is, and what it is to love my neighbor. And day and night I pray the Lord for love, and the Lord gives me tears to weep for the whole world. But if I find fault with any man, or look on him with an unkind eye, my tears will dry up and my soul sink into despondency. Yet do I begin again to entreat forgiveness of the Lord, and the Lord in his mercy forgives me a sinner. Brethren, St. Siloan continues, Before the face of my God I write, Humble your hearts, and while yet on this earth you will see the mercy of the Lord, and know your heavenly Creator, and your soul will never have their fill, and your souls will never have their fill of love. So we see that the love of Christ fills the very being of his saints. Thirdly, holy relics as a witness to the love of Christ in us. But whither does this all-embracing Christ-like love lead? The answer for St. Siloan is a simple one. Love of God takes various forms. The man who wrestles with wrong thoughts loves God according to his measure. He who struggles against sin and asks God to give him strength not to sin, but yet falls into sin again because of his infirmity and sorrows and repents, he possesses grace in the depths of his soul and mind, but his passions are not yet overcome. But the man who has conquered his passions now knows no conflict. All his concern is to watch himself in all things lest he fall into sin. Grace, great and perceptible, is his. But he who feels grace in both soul and body is a perfect man, and if he preserves this grace, his body is sanctified and his bones will make holy relics. There are, described in this passage, four stages of love, the fourth and highest of which is that which is attested to by the penetration of divine grace into the body, into the very marrow of a person's being. And this is identified by St. Siloan as the highest state of perfection the highest state of holiness. He who feels grace in both soul and body is a perfect man, and if he preserves this grace, his body is sanctified and his bones will make holy relics. As with Christ's voluntary death, in which it was not possible for the body of the Logos of life to see corruption, and which was thus raised together with his human soul on the third day, so too will it be with the bodies of those saints which have known great grace in this life, and who have been able to preserve it. They too, even after death, are not separated from the grace and love of God, neither in soul nor in body and hence their bodies are revealed as holy relics. Here we are confronted with an overwhelming mystery, that man is not truly man, not truly a human person or hypostasis, without 
his body. For this reason, even great saints patiently await the second and glorious coming in Christ, when by grace they will become united once more with their bodies. There will not be a judgment for them, for they have already been judged by holy self-condemnation. The second coming of Christ, then, will be for them the moment of their full realization as persons, and thus the inauguration of their full and perfect participation in the life in Christ, which is at one and the same time the life of the Most Holy Trinity. The sole exception to this, of course, is the Mother of God, the Theotokos, who as the mother of life, even after death, could not be held by the grave, but like her son, passed over into life. She therefore, even now, as a fully realized human hypostasis, enjoys the blessed life to which we have all been called. In our first section, we noted an important passage in St. Paul from his epistle to the Romans concerning sonship, suffering, and the final glory. Allow me to repeat it once more. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That is to say, in our adoption as sons, in our salvation. In our theosis in Christ. That is why St. Gregory Palamas affirms, except for sin, Nothing in this life, even death itself, is really evil, even if it causes suffering. Speaking of the torments that the martyrs were willing to endure, St. Gregory explains, quote, The martyrs made the violent death which others inflicted on them into something magnificent, a source of life, glory, and the eternal heavenly kingdom because they exploited it in a good way that pleased God. Christ's word is charged or loaded with his divine energy. His divine energy, life, and power, so too are his divine actions and his life on earth as man. When we fill ourselves with his words and strive earnestly to live according to his command and example, to love even our enemies as he did, as he does, so too do we by the grace of the Holy Spirit, enter into the sphere of life which is contained in them. There is, as Father Zacharias puts it, an exchange of lives which takes place. We thus become in our souls and in our bodies partakers of the divine nature through union with his flesh his humanity, sharers, that is, 
in the very divine life of Christ himself, which is at the same time the life of the Most Holy Trinity. We are saved not as individuals, but as persons hypostases, as members of the body of Christ, of which Christ is the head. We are united with him and through him with the other members of his body. Notice the following words from Father Sophronis, we shall see him as he is. Through his incarnation, the everlasting Logos of the Father gives us to partake of his blood and his flesh in order thereby to pour into our veins his eternal life that we may become his children, flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone. In holy relics, therefore, we do not see dead bones. Far from it. In holy relics, we see the result of communion with the Lord, the result of sharing the very life of the Most High God, communion with Him who is self-life, life itself. United with Christ, then, though we pass through the valley of the shadow of death, we pass from death unto eternal life. This is the point at which the created meets the uncreated, the point at which earth meets heaven face to face, and the point at which we created mortal human beings are transfigured by him into divine life. Thus are the perfect, thus are the saints, thus are they whose very bones have preserved grace to the end. Holy relics are the earthly remains of those who have been taught by none other than Christ himself to love their enemies even unto death, the death of the cross, which is his glory, and which by grace becomes their glory too. Love for enemies is not a moral injunction. It is the fundamental criterion for the Christian way of life. This is salvation, Yea, this is theosis. Truly, then, in this world there is nothing more difficult than to be saved. But as we begin to perceive salvation as theosis, so too do the dry bones seen by the prophet Ezekiel begin to receive life. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and ye shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live. And ye shall know that I am the Lord, 
when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. I shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Thank you. I apologize if that was a little long. Forgive me. But it is uh, an important subject, and believe it or not, as far as my capacities are concerned, uh, that was the abbreviated version. <laughs> so if anyone has any uh, comments or, or questions, please feel free. Yes. I have a question about the, uh, about the historical development of theology. <coughs> um, the doctrine of Chalcedon about the two natures of Christ, how was that... You know, could you could you sort of give an overview about that and what that was in response to, and then how Saint Gregory Palamas developed that in terms of in terms of his of, of his theology? In in less than twelve words, or uh, the, the, the simplified version. The simplified version. Yes. Uh, Well, of course, everything, everything uh, is an elaboration of what St. John Damascene refers to as the only truly new thing under the sun, which is the incarnation of the Son and Word of God. The mystery of how God became man that, as the saints say, and as Holy Scripture points out, uh, in order for us to be adopted, become adopted sons of God, uh, by grace what He is, by nature. Uh, so the question is always really, who is Christ? Who is the person who hung upon the cross? And Again, with the specific question in mind, what is the purpose of our existence? And as I was trying to uh, set out before you this great mystery of uh, the, mag the majestic vision of God offering us nothing less than his own life. We are created, we are creatures, brought into existence out of nothing by the good will of God, out of the superabundance of his love. It's a mystery that we are even here, existing, and even more so, therefore, is it a mystery that God's love is such that he wills to extend that communion that we see in the life of the three divine hypostases of the Holy Trinity. To extend that and to include the angelic powers and the human race. Communion. The communion of what? Of his very life. That's what is meant by being created in the image of God. The fathers describe the image of God in man in various ways, but ultimately uh, the fundamental point is that for reasons which only the Lord knows, we were called 
into existence out of nothing. And God bestowed upon us the capacity to contain his very life. So everything, everything is seen in the context of, of, of this great supreme gift of life and of divine life. We've not been created to continue existing on a human level of life, but on a suprahuman level, a life that is proper to God alone. That's why we say that we've been called to become gods by grace. So it's in this, it's in this context, it's from this perspective, that we should look at all of the teachings of the Church. And of course, the fundamental, the most important teaching of all is that which was um, loudly proclaimed by the First Ecumenical Council, that Christ is God. Christ is I am. Christ is the one who is at the center of every theophany, every manifestation of God in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament and now. And we'll talk about that in more detail, God willing, uh, in our second uh, presentation today. How we understand the, uh, the whole question of divine revelation. God revealing himself to man, man's encounter with God. But that's, what, that's what Holy Scripture is for us, a series of descriptions of man's encounter with God. So you ask specifically about Chalcedon, of course, very important. Um, another elaboration on uh, the biblical and patristic teaching on the person of Christ. That Christ is true and perfect God, but also true and perfect man. He's not a human person. He is not a human being. He is a divine person. He is the second person of the Holy Trinity who assumed our created human nature, our created human life. He made it his own. To use the language of St. Cyril of Alexandria, he appropriated human nature and our human life. Precisely that means that he made it his own. How did he do that? By uniting it personally, hypostatically, to his person. St. Cyril of Alexandria says he didn't take a human prosopon, person. Scripture says, and the word of and the word was made flesh. Not the word was made a human prosopon, a person. This is very important because there is tremendous confusion out there on that very question. Even, even among those who want to, quite rightly, insist upon the divinity of Christ. They don't appreciate su sufficiently that Christ is not a human being. Christ, at best, at, at most, we can say that he's a divine and human being. But he's a divine and human being because the Son and Word of God assumed our human nature and made it his, his own. Not as, <clears throat> to, to elaborate a little, not as uh, 
some used to say that the Logos dwelt in the man, Jesus, as the Spirit of God dwells in a temple. Or that the Logos became flesh in the sense that he put on the human nature of a man as putting on clothes, the, the analogy of, of uh, investing himself with clothing. No. The Logos became flesh. And I alluded to this uh, mystery, uh, referring to St. Cyril of Alexandria, who gives us that, that clear formulation of Orthodox Christology, the understanding of who Christ is, um, because, for example, he says that Christ prayed. He was doing something that's proper to his human nature, but not to his divine nature. Um, and we see a great mystery here that the Logos, God the Word, in the flesh, allowed himself according to the flesh, to do certain things that were natural to his human nature, but not to his divine nature. First of all, he was born. We say that the Logos, who was born? There's only one person, right? So it's the Logos in the flesh who was born. Who suffered and died? Who was tempted? Who was... Um, who experienced the agony in Gethsemane? Um, these are all great mysteries. But the one thing that they all have in common is to show us that Christ did not come as Superman. He truly took on our human life. Everything that we are, he, he made his own, except for sin. Why except for sin? Because sin is unnatural. Sin is separation from God. So he took all of our human nature, and in that very assumption, from the very moment that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the, in the virgin's womb, he deified our human nature. He sanctified it, in other words, to the point of perfection. In his person, he made it his own. There's a, lot, there's a lot that we could say about that. It is, it is truly the fundamental teaching of the uh, Christianity. It's, it's about the, the mystery of the person, who Christ is. And of course, that's, that's underlined and it's elaborated uh, by the saints from generation to generation who bear witness to us in every generation that the life in Christ is possible for each and every one of us, no matter where we may be spiritually, no matter what time, what period in the history of the world we find ourselves, that that miracle of transformation into the likeness of Christ can take place from this life and continues in the, le in the next life unceasingly, uh, eternally. So I know, that, I know that I've left a lot out in answering that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Much please. You said something that's rather startling to me and actually a little bit alarming. I think when you said uh, you cannot live with Christ unless we are like him in all respects. And that um, I don't think that I have ever expected for myself to be perfect. And I think that I have comforted myself quite a bit with the idea that. I'm not expected to be perfect in this life. I am expected to be turning in the right direction. 
and I am expected to do everything that I am at whatever level, as you just said, where, wherever I am, I am doing the best I can. But I wonder now if, if that is true, um, who then can be saved <laughs> is, my, is my question, I guess, and, and is it is it our, is the expectation of perfection what we strive for to enter heaven at all? Or, can, you know what I'm, I can't get to my question, but I think you know what I mean. Yes, you know, uh, Matushka, thank you. Um, The whole Christian life is a paradox, isn't it? Um, what, do, what do the holy prophets, the saints, what do they exclaim when they see Christ, when they experience the vision of Christ in, in glory, the vision of the resurrected Christ? All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We are unworthy of such a great God. We are unworthy of such a great calling. And only God can save. And when he saves us, he saves us only by his mercy. I suppose that our, our task is to say, along with the patri patriarchs, when the Lord calls us, behold, Lord, here I am. But that answer means that we're opening the doors of our heart to him. to allow him to come in and to work his miracle in us. Perfection, in the orthodox sense of the word, is a dynamic state. The important thing is for us to make a beginning and the way that we do that is by repentance. The Holy Gospel begins with repentance. And if you read the end of the Gospel according to St. Luke carefully, you see it also ends with repentance, preaching repentance. Uh, what does repentance mean? It means we're being willing to change, being open to Christ's transforming grace and love. Uh, to, in other words, enter on the path of that road which leads to Christ-like perfection and which has no end, because his perfection has no end. But we know that it can begin in this life, and by the grace of God continues even in the next. So I think that that's, that's the important thing, because Christ, our Lord, would not have exhorted us to be perfect as our Father, which is in heaven, is perfect, if it were something that were ridiculously unattainable. And I'll tell you a story, uh, briefly, I promise, um, about the question of repentance and, and willing to repent and how we cannot be with Christ unless we are willing to change, because unless we change, we cannot become like him. Uh, once upon a time, I, I was uh, at the monastery of St. John the Baptist, uh, and it just, it, it just was the case during that period that whenever I would see Father Sophroni, 
I wanted to turn and run a mile in the opposite direction. It was an absurd situation, but I really felt it very, very acutely. This was not some uh, emotion. I didn't want to be in his presence. And I was puzzled by this and, and, and somewhat troubled. So much so that eventually, I, I, speaking to Father Raphael, a disciple of Father Sofroni, Father Raphael Noika, who, who is in Romania now, um, I said to him, you know, Father, it's the strangest thing. Whenever I see Father Sofroni, I feel like running in the opposite direction. I was embarrassed to say it to Father Raphael, but at least I, he, was, he was very easy uh, to talk to. I used to, he was my first teacher, I regard him as my, my first teacher. And Father Raphael smiled and he said, he, he, obviously he recognized this uh, condition. And he said to me, why don't you tell him? I said, what? You want me to, <laughs> you want me to go up to Father Sofroni and say, Father Sofroni, every time I see you, I want to run a mile in the opposite <laughs> direction? And he said, yeah. Well, I was. <laughs> it took me. It took me some time to pluck up enough courage to do that. But one day, um, as Father Sofroni was walking uh, from his from his little house to the um, to the old rec to the kitchen of the old rectory, um, and it, usually there were people around him and uh, you know asking him questions, receiving blessings, and yeah. And I thought, oh. Good. <laughs> He's busy. <laughs> um, and uh, I thought, well, you know, I'll hang around, but if, if it's not possible, it's not possible. And then as he entered into the kitchen of the old rectory, suddenly all these people disappeared. It was uh, uh, very unusual. They all disappeared, and there I was. It might have been the only time this has ever happened to me in my life standing just face to face with Father Sofroni and I thought, okay, now's the time. Father Sofroni, may I um, tell you something? I said, yes. I said, Father, I, I, forgive me, but every time I see you, I want to run away. And he nodded his head and said, um, hmm, uh, have I done anything to offend you? I said, no, Father, no, no, no. He said, have I said anything to offend you? I said, no, no, absolutely not, no. He said, huh. Then, it's probably not from God. So I, I nodded. And he said, go with my blessing. That was it. That did the trick. Uh, that feeling went away. But later, um, you know, as one absorbs these experiences and you, you gain, by the grace of God, you <coughs> gain a certain understanding of what was happening to you at the time, I realized that there was something in me that was not not right. And by Father, Father Sophroni's prayers, that spirit went away. But put simply, uh, I was not in a state of repentance. I was, I was not willing to repent. I, I couldn't approach a holy man because his very presence was a judgment. His life is a judgment. You can't approach a holy man. You can't stand to be with him. If you are yourself content in your own way. And we see that this is the case with holy persons because that's the case with God. They are wholly given to God and so they reflect God 
in their person. We can't, we can't be with God if we're not in a state of repentance. Repentance is not that negative, morbid thing that we have in the world. The world doesn't understand repentance. Repentance is that privilege that we have been called to be transformed, to become, to grow into the image of Christ. the privilege of being raised up to the level of divine being. And so it's, it's of fundamental importance. It's dynamic. It's the life in, in God. And what is true of God by nature, as we said, is true of his saints by grace. And it is what we've all been called to become. In, I say this, I say this because it's what the church teaches. In the kingdom of heaven, there is no second class citizenship. To be seated on the right hand of God the Father, Christ raised our human nature to the right hand of God the Father. That means equality. And as Father Sophroni says, as God, as the Son and Word of God, he was always equal. So what, what do we see? What is it that's new? It's our human nature in Christ that has been raised up and given that possibility. We say nature because we said he is a divine person. And so it remains for each person created in the image of Christ to follow his way to the right hand of God the Father. Amazing. Amazing. All we can do is give thanks. Praise God in gratitude for the unfathomable gift that he is offering us the gift of his very life. Yes, Father. Um, I've, I've always um, had trouble sort of conceptualizing um, what, what is it that the, the saints don't possess now that they will possess or be able to do when reunited with the, with the human body? Is this the contact with the material world? Or is there, I, I, because, I mean, uh, clearly they're, they're able to move and act and, and um, intercede. And what, what, is, what difference will that make? Or what is the difference between the state that, you know, the, state of, 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 uh, of existence uh, between what saints are experiencing now and, and what they'll experience after the general resurrection? That's a, that's a great question. Um, all the time, as we said, we're dealing with these mysteries that really pass our understanding. And, and it would be a lie if I said to you, I understand it, and, and you know. But, but one, you know, we, know, we know certain parameters, given parameters. We know, for example, that uh, man, as created by God, is a psychosomatic unity, body and soul. That's man. And, and, and that distinguishes us from the, from the angelic powers. Um, and when we say that, we have to, uh, we also have to make a, a little qualification because, you know, in ancient times, there was a distinction between body and soul, uh, but understood in a very, very different way, that the true man was the soul and that the life in the body was something of an unfortunate parenthesis until the 
soul could once again escape back to the realm of the, of the divine. But we have inherited the biblical, patristic understanding of the human person. And that's why I said that the hypostasis, the human person, is not truly and fully a human person unless we have this psychosomatic unity. And we see, what do we see from the outset? We see man in Adam as such, Adam and Eve. And when Adam chose to disobey God, he died spiritually. He suffered a spiritual death. And we see the consequences of that death were uh, the, the death also of the body, the physical death that followed some time later, but it was an inevitable consequence of the fall. Spiritual death first, physical death follows. And this is, this is at the point at which corruption enters the life of man. Death and corruption, where the body dissolves. And, and man is not, man is divided, man is not truly man without his body. And we see that in Christ, because Christ did not come as a spirit. He came in the flesh. He restored our human nature in his person. So, given that man is not truly man without his body, uh, given that Christ is our, the measure and the pattern of all things, for us Christians, and the resurrection of Christ includes his body, we see, we see once again the divine purpose in God's creation of man. At the Transfiguration, what do we see? At the Transfiguration, what is revealed is Christ's pre-eternal glory, which, again, he always had. But how do we see it at the Transfiguration? What is new at the Transfiguration is that we see Christ allowing us a vision of his pre-eternal divine glory revealed in and through his human flesh, which is a clear indication to us that it's God's good will to save us in our full personal hypostatic integrity. That the spirit, this is the mystery of the human life, and, and we live this, and we know this by experience, even, even when we're not in the church, as it were. Our spiritual life affects our physical life, and our physical life affects our spiritual life. In other words, what we do with our bodies actually has an impact on our spiritual life, on our relationship with God. Sometimes we think, ah, oh, you know, I'm doing this and that. That's exercise. Yes, it may just be exercise for certain people. But anything you do, the liturgy teaches us movement. Don't get me wrong, but there's a kind of, as Father Raphael used to say, there's a, there's a choreography in the liturgy. 
We're moving. Our bodies are participating. And what are we learning? We're learning how to approach God. We're learning how to worship God. With our bodies. Doesn't St. Paul say that? Worship God also with your body. That's what we're learning to do in the divine liturgy. What happens in Western churches? Where do they put their bodies? In between pews. There's very little room for, for movement, for a prostration, for, because the focus is on the spirit soaring you know, to the tips of the, of the wonderful church spires. And, and beyond, pointing to, to the heavenly realms, right? That's not the case in the Orthodox tradition. We worship God also with our body because we recognize, not through some brilliant form of rationalization, but we recognize by the experience that living as members of the body of Christ, that what we do with ourselves, every aspect of ourselves, has a direct impact on our spiritual life. Our spiritual life affects our physical life. When Adam died spiritually, then he died physically. And so, every physical action as well as every spiritual, carries or contains within it a certain ethos, a certain spirit. I used to, may God forgive me, I, I used to, uh, I did it for, ex I th thought it was good exercise. I used to do karate in a former life. But I used to do that. And that's fine, but after a certain point, you realize it carries an ethos, it carries a spirit. How you, how you carry yourself, how you stand, what you do in the various movements, all of that bears witness to a certain spirit that ultimately you have to decide, is it in keeping with what I learn in church? or not. At that time, Father Sofroni was my, my spiritual father, and he very patiently, very lovingly, he didn't say anything to me. But as I would go and talk to him, it became obvious that it didn't help. Because our physical life affects our spiritual life. And here again we see, what do we see? The mystery of who we are. We are body and soul. We are a psychosomatic unity. And so the saints, first of all, Christ is the first begotten of the dead. He is the author of our salvation. He's the Alpha and the Omega. What we see in him is that's, that's the goal of our, what we see in his human aspect is our goal. The flesh is not dematerialized and spiritualized to the point of being lost. It's transformed, it's transfigured. How? By the grace of the Holy Spirit. Explain how that's done? Well, we don't know. These things surpass us. But we know it's true because he reveals himself in the flesh. When he revealed himself to the disciples, they touched him. He could eat, and yet he passed through walls. He was not just a spirit. He rose with his body, and the fact that he raised it to the right hand of God the Father means forever. 
so the mystery is that the saints are still waiting for something which, as I said, has already been accomplished in Christ and is already visible, lest we should need an example, it's already visible in His Most Holy Mother. So what is that something? Well, we could describe it in terms of a fuller and more perfect union with Christ. That, as we said, begins in this life and it continues in the next. But what it is to be you is continued and fulfilled, fulfilled in the next life. And we see that that is possible because Christ in his divine person has united our nature fully and perfectly to his person. And we see that as a further confirmation of that truth that a human hypostasis is also enjoying that future blessed life from this moment to which we have all been called. And the saints await, they await the, the second coming of Christ for that. Are they, not, are they not in communion? Are they not in union with God from now? Yes, they are. When it says that the, all creation groans are waiting for the coming of the, son, the sons of God, <coughs> so somehow there's still some di disconnection um, <coughs> between what man was supposed to be to creation and what he is even in heaven. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, Father. Uh, there's time for a question. You know, uh, as an evangelical, one of the things that was emphasized was the solidarity that Christ has with, with humanity. Um, and the solidarity, as I talk to various people who I've encountered, would include suffering with uh, certain passions on the inside. In other words, struggling with, uh, you know, uh, even, I think even if you read Callisto Square, or Metropol <coughs> Metropolitan Callisto Square, that that he emphasizes the point that he suffered or was tempted in all ways according to how we are. However, in the Christology you're presenting, he was deified at his uh, conception of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, in so many ways, his humanity, as you're saying, he's not a human being. And in so many ways does not have solidarity with us. Um, he does, in other words, he does not know what it is to suffer with temptations that make him want to drink or uh, alcohol or lust or so many. Um, could you elaborate? Is there any way, uh, when I've taught this, I've, I've actually lost people because there was so much emphasis on their own inner pain and they want, when Jesus is on the cross saying, my God, my God, they want that to him to be identifying with their pain and they want him how, you know, when we say that that which is not assumed cannot be healed, how is it that he can heal me of alcoholism or lust or any of these things if he has not assumed it? And that's a question I've encountered. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a good question. That <clears throat> our human nature, <clears throat> forgive me, um, our human nature was healed <coughs> by Christ at the moment that he, the, the, the new Adam was conceived. And the, the different stages in his saving work are really manifestations of that fact, of who it was who truly became man. And that's why your question um, relates to 
what I said about sin, Hebrews says, except sin, right? He became like unto us in all respects, except sin, because sin is not natural. So anything that, anything that is sinful as a result of a sinful act of the will cannot be true of Christ. Cannot, it cannot be true of Christ. Anything that is, anything is that is the result of a sinful act of will cannot be true of Christ because we say that Christ has two wills, right? Because of his two natures, he has two wills, divine and human. And although this sounds like a clever play on words, it's not. It's really true that Christ's human will because it is the human will of who? Of the divine person, of the Son and Word of God, was always in harmony with the divine will. Always, from the very moment of conception. So it's not true when Christ is depicted, as he is sometimes depicted, in the Garden of Gethsemane, in conflict with himself. There's that ghastly film, I won't even, I won't even mention its name, but it, its title, but uh, is presented as in conflict with himself. There's, there, there's seemingly two subjects in Christ. There's the man, Jesus, who's saying, no, I don't want to die. And then there's Jesus, the Son and Word of God, who's saying, but must. He's not a schizophrenic. His human will was always willing what his divine will willed it to will. And in that, he is an example to us. In other words, that our goal, our task, if you will, is to enter into the stream of his will and his life as Adam was created. When, when people are disappointed by the, the correct, shall we say, I hope the, it's the correct um, the teaching of Christ, um, it's because they don't see the same desires and passions in Christ. They want to see desires, lusts, and passions in Christ. That's not even natural for us. We are unnatural. We are sick. That's why we're in the hospital. We wouldn't need the church if we weren't sick. Just to illustra yeah. illustrate yeah. your point, we uh, in prison, <clears throat> I said, so you think he suffered with this? And then, of course, we have 20 inmates. And, and he suffered with this, and he suffered with this. So he suffered with all of our passions, you know. And it was, you know, you're thinking, now you don't even suffer with all these passions of murder and, and you know, all the other things. Yet he was supposed to take all that on. And how hard, you know, it was very different understanding, obviously. But what you said is, is very true. You're quoting St. Gregory the Theologian that what was not assumed was not healed. So what we know that in the person of Christ, every aspect of our humanity was assumed. And the mystery of him crying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, is not an act. It's not something that was easy for him. Why did he... Why did he shed drops of blood in Gethsemane? You know why? St. Saint, uh, Saint John Damascene, I'm thinking of, but all the, all the saints say. I'll quote something from St. John of the Ladder. We're going to celebrate St. John Climacus on the fourth Sunday, Sunday of Great Lent. What a great, 
What a great saint. He said, though Christ feared death, he was not terrified by it. Though Christ feared death, he was not terrified by it. He shed drops of blood. It wasn't acting. It was real. What was taking place in the God-man? The saints tell us that this was the result of the fact that death had no hold on him by virtue of the fact that he was innocent and pure. There was no, there was no place in him for death to take hold. His passion, he describes it as the cup. And, and what does he do? He sees it as, as the cup given to him by the Father. He doesn't even look at those, the, the others. Who is inflicting this unjust death on him, this passion? So, his death is unnecessary. He doesn't have to die. He's the, he is the author of life. What a contradiction for the author of life to, to, to be, ha, face the prospect of death. But he voluntarily, voluntarily accepts death. The unjust death that others have inflicted upon him for the life of the world. He sheds drops of blood because he fears death. He fears it in the sense that he shrinks. It's natural for him to shrink away from death. Death has no hold on him. It's totally foreign. It's a contradiction in, in term. It's absurd that the author of life should see death. Yet he voluntarily deigns to accept death. And thereby he shows us the reality of his incarnation. That the Son and Word of God is going to die according to the mystery of his incarnation in the flesh. As God, he can't die. But he, it's, it, he's one person. It's the same person who raises Lazarus from the dead. It's the same person who weeps for him when he hears that his friend has died. So it's natural for him to shrink from death. And we see that the agony is also real, very real, because the incarnation is real. And the Holy Scriptures emphasize that time and time again to us, because without the incarnation, our salvation would be called into question. That our God came, he dwelt among us, but it was, it was easy for him. Easy stuff. So, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We know, but that's not play acting. Mysteriously, he lived the abandonment of God. He who is God took on all of our sin in the sense of sinfulness and experienced even that at the point just before death, but then he proclaims, forgive them for they know not what they do. He allows his human nature, his humanity, to live in a human way, though he is God, to emphasize the reality of the incarnation 
by which he chose to save us. And St. Gregory Palamas says, God could have saved us any way he wished, but he rightly chose this dispensation. Why? Because it most perfectly reveals to us his self-sacrificial love and the humility of Christ, which is the very way that God exists. Uh, yeah. We're about 30 minutes over, which is fine. We've, <clears throat> we need to be, to be back here in about an hour. <clears throat> we can maybe take one more question, but you can get if you want to ask yours, and then maybe wrap up this session and go down and have lunch and then come back. <clears throat> sure. Uh, I'd like to just want you to elaborate on something, uh, perhaps even hear, hear correctly, but it would speak by interest. You mentioned that some of the agony Christ went through um, had to do with asynchronicity of the natures within him. Yes. Um, I'd love to hear more about that. Well, uh, going back to the question that the gentleman asked, I think he's left, um, about the Fourth Ecumenical Council, you can have a, an orthodox understanding of the two natures of Christ, and of course you can have a, an incorrect understanding of the two natures in Christ. We have what's, uh, in, in theological terminology, is referred to as an asymmetrical two-nature Christology. Meaning, what I said earlier, that it's the Son and Word of God who became like us by the Holy Ghost and the Virgin Mary, um, was made man. So he, he didn't become a human person. There are not two persons in Christ or two subjects. Um, the, one, uh, the one suffering on the cross and the one uh, performing miracles in a divine way revealing his divinity is the same. The one he is a single prosopic unity, one person, uh, now uh, living, uh, manifesting his divinity, now showing his uh, humanity. So asymmetrical in the sense that you don't have uh, a, a divine person and a human person. You have a divine person who took our human nature, flesh, but not, uh, he didn't take a human person, he, he took our human nature. Two nature Christology, asymmetrical in that sense, which is put in perf perfectly in keeping with the one nature language that we have before Chalcedon in the, uh, yeah, think so. Some would call that neophysitism, right? Um, yes. You can have one nature Christology, which is orthodox, one nature Christology, which is not orthodox. So um, ultimately, you have, to, you have to say, okay, what, what do you mean by the terms that you're using? We know, we know from our uh, fellow Christian brethren of other denominations that we say Christ, we say church, we say so many things that on the surface we're saying the same thing. But when we, when we look at what we mean by them, we have different, a different uh, take on them. So that um, imbalance, you say, creating agony sometimes, is that what, where we, like, the agony on the cross was created by that imbalance? That's, that's what it kind of happens. Oh, the imbal uh, connecting, connecting the, the asymmetrical with the, the sufferings of Christ? Yeah, I thought you said something about that that produced some suffering. Um, not, not, not necessarily saying which. Mm. No, I was just, I was just uh, trying to point out that uh, the fact that Christ is not a human person, the fact that Christ did not assume sin, he did not sin, and it was not possible for him 
to sin does not make him any less of the God-man. In other words, it does not diminish the reality and significance of his incarnation and therefore of him as a pattern and a model for our life. I have, I have a question. I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to... Um, it's okay. Uh, but in, but I, I'm struggling a little bit um, with um, maybe the terminology. I, I, I kind of understand kind of what you're getting at. But when you say Christ did not become a human person, um, you know, it really seems that theology of the church, you know, that Christ, you know, um, did, um, you know, he's fully God, he's fully man. So when you say that he didn't become a human person, what exactly are you meaning when you say that? I'm saying that there are not two subjects in Christ. Christ is one. In fact, St. Cyril of Alexandria wrote a treatise entitled precisely that, that Christ is one. And it's important, it's important because um, who is the one who hung upon the cross? It was God. God himself. God, the second person of the Holy Trinity. Not God the Father, not God the Holy Spirit. But the second person of the Holy Trinity truly became man, truly became flesh. And as such, he is our salvation. He became what we are so that we may become what he is. But that doesn't mean that there are two centers of consciousness or two persons or two subjects in Christ. He is the same one. We do, we do need, I mean, I appreciate your questions, all of your questions, because this is of tremendous significance, and um, it takes time to sink in. It certainly took time for it to sink in with me. Um, but it goes back to that fundamental question. Christ became what we are so that we could become what he is. And it had to be God who did that. If it were not God himself, there would be no salvation. Similarly, if, he, if God did not become, well, I said it, I mean, if God did not him, his, himself did not become man in, as not a person, but did not take every aspect of our human life upon himself and make it his own, then it would have been like play acting. So it's, it's in order to maintain that balance. Um, God became man so that we might, we might be made gods. And it's unpacking that and answering to the, the question that was posed uh, right at the outset. <clears throat> Everything that the church teaches us is, is really elaborating on that fundamental point. In other words, who is our salvation? What is the goal of our existence? The purpose why we were brought into existence. The reality of the incarnation. In other words, the reality of the way that God willed to save us. We tend to think that, and this is human, it, it's humanly understandable, we tend to think that if he truly became man, he must have become a human person. He must have taken a... Is a human person truly a human person without a hypostasis, without a, a person? I mean, what is a human nature? It doesn't exist, does it? No, it doesn't exist. There's no such thing as a human nature that exists by itself. But it doesn't exist in the person of the Logos either, by itself. It exists as his nature. It's God's nature. If he had assumed a human person, whose 
nature would it be? Would it be the nature of God or would it be the nature of the human person? It would be the nature of the human person. That's the heresy. We, we, we can discuss that later. I, I don't want to be in trouble with my, with my hosts. <laughs>